My name is Kelsey. I am going to try to show you how to start contributing to the Linux kernel for anybody who is interested in um, at least knowing how that all works or getting started on doing that. Um, I am a software engineer over at Microsoft. I work on the Linux kernel team. Um, I currently maintain the WSL2 kernel and work on internal toolings. Um, my colleague Alan is going to be here helping. Um, so. I am grateful for he agreed to come on at the end and help to talk about the common pitfalls that people run into when they start contributing to the Linux kernel. Um, so hopefully we can help avoid newbies coming in from making some of those common mistakes. All right. So uh, just give you a little bit of a review on what we'll cover is a bit of the recommended to know before starting. Uh, the life of a kernel, so where it's going to get started and running into the, through the development cycle through the end of life. Um, then different ways that you can get involved from reporting bugs, uh, testing release candidate kernels, which are just kernels that are before they get released, uh, review and testing patches on mailing list, how to submit your own patches, and finding tasks and bugs to work on, and then um, those common pitfalls that Alan will come in and help with. So recommended to know before starting is going to be some of the intro uh, links to kernel, know where to get the source code, um, building it, um, making at least a little bit of a change in the config is going to be great, just starting to mess with it. How to recover if your kernel won't boot, always make sure that you have a known good kernel on your system. At some point, you will run into um, not being able to boot your kernel. I'm sure if a lot of you are starting to uh, maybe look at how to contributing. You might have already discovered this. Um, know where all the kernel documents live. It's going to cover pretty much everything that is in this presentation and so much more, also including once you get into the code, the drivers. Um, if you're wanting to change things, a lot of the documentation is going to cover that. So um, the doc a lot of the documentation live in the source tree. So if you actually, once you get the source code for the kernel, if you go into the primary directory, you'll see documents. Go in there, you will find just about everything. Um, it is wonderful. Um, also knowing Git, having an understanding of version control and general knowledge of Git commands is really good. Um, you definitely will learn the Git commands pretty quick um, once you start getting into getting the kernel and starting to contribute, of course, as well. So uh, down at the bottom, there are a couple guides that I have listed. Um, both of these guides are the Linux Foundation Beginner's Guide and the First Kernel Patch for Linux Kernel Newbies. Both these guides are going to walk you through getting the source, pretty much everything here and more. Um, getting the source, how to build it, how to make your first change um, about the community, and being able to start contributing. Um, there is also a tutorial on Git down here as well. Um, do you notice I don't actually have a requirement of having a strong understanding of code. So a lot of people think being C, needing to know C pretty strongly, and there may be some people who might disagree with me, maybe having at least some kind of foundation there would be good, but there is testing that you can start doing as you're learning. So if you are just getting into it and you're not feeling super strong on you know, C or understanding the code, there are still ways that you can get in and help do testing and getting involved while you're learning that, and then it's a great way to get exposed to the code and start better understanding that. So big part before contributing is understanding the development cycle of the Linux kernel. Um, so there is what is called the, referred to as the upstream kernel. Um, the upstream kernel is where everybody, most people ideally get their kernel from kind of refer to it as the like, one kernel to rule them all. It is, if you look at, in the middle here, it shows mainline. So this kernel is consistently being updated. It has about a nine to 10 week um, development cycle before releasing a new kernel. And that is going to go into stable. And then there is often several different stable, they'll have different life cycles, but it's all coming from this one mainline source that just keeps building on top of each other. So if you see here on this, closer to me, where it shows the list of mainline, stable, and long-term, these are the, well, these are the current, or at least as of on uh, a few days ago, um, versions that we have out. So mainline 6.9 RC4, that's release candidate four, 
6.9 is the kernel that we are currently working on and going to be releasing into stable in about three weeks, depending on how many bugs are found. Um, that there can be some variability in there. Um, the last stable that was released was 6.8, um, so that is the recent stable kernel out. And if you notice, the numbers all trend together, so it goes down to 6.7, 6.6. So a new stable kernel is released approximately every um, nine to 10 weeks, depending on how many bugs are found um, and when it can be deemed a stable kernel and sent out, and then another cycle is going to start. Um, you'll see here there's already a stable with the end of life. So new stable is released about every nine to 10 weeks. It is going to supersede whatever the last stable was. The one exception is going to be long-term, which you'll usually see listed as an LTS kernel. These are supported for at least two years. There can be some variability that causes those to be supported for longer. Um, anything that is stable and long-term, by the way, only will get bug fixes. Um, no new features come into it. So the only time that you're gonna ever see new features coming into the kernel is when a, for most users, it, they're gonna see it once it hits a new stable kernel comes out. Um, now, if you di start diving into mainline testing or even going up to um, testing like subsystem branches, which are where each different subsystems in the kernel are testing their, bringing in new patches, um, you can get features a lot earlier. You can also catch a lot more problems earlier, but there's a lot of help to be done there and being able to help catch and fix those um, within um, earlier stages of development. All right, so, and I guess last thing on this slide is you will see um, down at the bottom, so it goes from stable. That's usually then also where a library Linux distros will start to get the kernel. So if you get, like, let's say you just download the latest Ubuntu, um, they are likely going to be on the latest um, LTS. A lot of times they're gonna pick LTS kernels. Um, the reason being is because they're gonna have a longer life in getting bug fixes versus the 10 week cycle. So. Generally, a lot of distros will pick being on an LTS kernel just because they can stay on that same, consistently be on a stable kernel. A lot of their users aren't gonna run into as many issues because it's just bug fixes going into it at that point. And then they'll usually update to another LTS once a new one's announced. All right, so this expands on the life of a kernel a little bit. Um, this is just laid out if we pick just one kernel um, a lot of times there's several of these things that happen at once, so a little bit of confusion can sometimes pop in there when you're seeing one kernel is at one point and another is somewhere else. So if we just say we're working on 6.9 right now, so before 6.9 started we were in the pre-cycle, that is where um, developers are all sending features and fixes to mailing lists, which is where a lot of the, uh, everything, a lot of things are handled. We'll cover mailing lists in just a moment here. Um, basically we're prepping the new features. Um, there's maintainers for all the subsystems that are helping collect these uh, new features and fixes, getting them tested locally. Um, there is a branch called Linux Next that's used to help stage and then test to make sure that different subsystem patches are coming together and work well together. Um, as you imagine, that can be, when you start introducing that many patches together sometimes, you can catch a lot of problems and it's good to be testing in there and bring those together before we're trying to bring it into mainline. Um, so before a cycle starts, it's a little bit of the collecting the features and doing the initial test. Um, then we're gonna have a cycle start. So this is that approximately nine to 10 week cycle that I mentioned before. When the cycle starts, it starts with a two week merge cycle, or sorry, two week merge window. This is the only time that new features can get added into the kernel. So if you want to see a new feature added in, um, you want to get it in during the pre-cycle. Um, really, that's any time before a cycle starts. So if you miss one cycle, wait the nine to 10 weeks and you're gonna have another merge window that pops up. But you want to have it onto the subsystem mailing list approved by the maintainer where they grabbed it before this merge window opens. Then they are going to send a PR to mainline during this merge window to be included for the next stable release. So while the merge window happens, generally especially for anybody who's new into Linux kernel development, um, there's not really going to be a lot for you to do during this time. Maybe do the, if you're, well, correction, 
there is consistently always new patches going to the mailing list. So I guess there is always something to be testing and checking out, or you could be developing um, your own stuff. Um, but there is at least during this phase a little bit, often less LTS stuff going on, less fixes really need to get out. Um, and then of course there's no, um, on main lines not sending out uh, release kernels themselves. Um, once the window closes, we move into the bug fix and stabilization period. This one is a little bit more variable in time depending on how problematic the kernel is. So how it starts is window closes and then on the Linux Chrome mailing list, there's going to be an announcement for say 6.9, it's gonna start with 6.9-RC1. So release candidate one. So this is the official stage kernel for the release. Um, and there's gonna be a call for people to come in and test it. Um, then about, people are gonna be testing it, working with maintainers to be able to send fixes. So fixes are gonna be, lots of stuff usually is found during this phase and we're then sending fixes, new PRs up to mainline. And then about, I think it's once a week, a new RC is going to see, and you'll see RC2, three, and it's usually about that RC7. Sometimes it can, it, this is quite variable, until it can be deemed stable enough to be released out for, that we're confident enough that it's not going to cause a lot of havoc. Uh, once it gets deemed stable enough for release, um, new stable kernel is announced. Uh, this is at a point, some people are gonna start taking the new stable kernel at this point. Um, some distros like to live right up at the top, some wait for LTS and um, are a little bit safer. Um, so new kernel is released. At this point, um, the cycle starts over when it comes to the mainline. So once 6.9 is released, a cycle is going to, a merge window is gonna start for 6.10. Um, 6.9 is then going to go into the stable review and update process. So at this point, it is bug fixes only. It is bug fixes only that are coming down from mainline. So as new bug fixes go into mainline, they're gonna get backported down into uh, the stable kernel. So anything that's still supported is not end of life. So usually it's whatever the prior stable kernel is and anything deemed LTS is going to be receiving bug fixes. Um, these are about once a week. It is as needed. Um, these are a great thing to test, um, especially for people just entering. Um, it gets announced on the stable mailing list. Um, there's a 48 hour test window and it usually gets released after RC1. Um, a lot of times if there is a problem, it might make it to RC2 and it's about a four, yeah. Pretty not, it's not generally pr a problematic release. Um, and then at the very end, it is the kernel meets end of life. So um, that is just when a new stable kernel supersedes the prior one, or if an LTS kernel reaches its end of support and doesn't get extended. So I mentioned the mailing list a couple times already, and sorry, checking time to make sure that I don't go too slow or fast here. So. Um, on the mailing list, this is where a lot of the communication happens. All patches are gonna be going through mailing lists. There is a mailing list for pretty much everything that's in the kernel. There is a primary one called the Linux kernel mailing list. You see about in the middle here. Um, it is a very high volume mailing list. Um, this is a great one to be on. <laughs> so pretty much a lot of everything is gonna go there. I, this is the one that I primarily put the warning of um, make sure to get familiar with the mailing list before you start subscribing. Your, the LKML list alone gets hundreds of emails in a day. It's a very easy way to overflow, overflood your email and get overwhelmed yourself and um, get email fatigue. And it's a great kernel to check or a great mailing list to kind of check in on, which you can do through, there's archives of all the mailing lists online. So this is a great way if you just want to poke on and see what's been happening without get, getting flooded yourself. Lore.kernel.org is a great place to go. It's gonna be, it's where this screenshot is from. And if you go to this page, you will see there is a much longer list. This is a very small snippet. Um, so there is a mailing list for every subsystem. Um, there is also some other mailing lists that are more like, there's a kernel newbies um, mailing list even. So this is where all the communication and all the patches are gonna go through for 
that you'll send them, um, if you review them, and any communication on for review and accepting and getting merged. Um, for navigating the mailing list, there's a few key points I wanted to bring up. Uh, first is you're gonna notice, if you're used to just a lot of the standard email replies, uh, mail on the mailing list are a little bit different of where it is inline communication. So instead of what's called top posting, so in most e email practices you do top posting where you respond, the whole email conversation goes to the bottom, you reply on top. Um, instead, most communication is you're gonna have to scroll down through the first thing, the first email sent or the patch is gonna be at top. And you're gonna add comments into where you're wanting to respond. Um, this is great because um, the second point here is everything is in plain text. So the inline commenting helps that with, if everything is text, you can go in and leave comments throughout the whole email. So if there is a question, you can put it right, you can put it right in the bottom, right next to the question. You can put comments into patches. So whether you're questioning why a function was written a certain way. Oh, what happened? Oh no. You know what's fun? I was having a different problem earlier and I thought I was free of uh, free of them. Hopefully this doesn't happen again. All right. Where were we? Now I'm thrown off. Okay. <laughs> So we did the inline uh, plain text only. Plain text only, good to remember, as you start uh, sending stuff yourself onto the mailing list, do you remember this, please don't send attachments, anything to that sort, um, it is going to be plain text only. Um, this is very beneficial for reviews, keeps everything similar and easy to work with. Um, it is recommended to use get send email uh, for that, uh, especially as somebody who's just getting into it, this is a great tool to start using is the getting to know the get send email. And then the third super important part is um, getting to know the tags. You will see this in a lot of, every patch is going to have at least one tag, which is the signed off by. All patches require this. Um, it will not get accepted into mainline if it doesn't have a signed off by tag. Um, only you can add it. Do not add other people signed off by tags without their permission. Um, the other tags you'll see are the tested by, reviewed by. Um, if you go onto a mailing list and you test somebody's patch, then you can throw on the mailing list, you're gonna add your tested by, it's gonna be your name, uh, email, and say you can throw your tag in there that you tested it and you're signing off on it. Um, same for the reviewed. Act by is used by maintainers um, if they're not applying it themselves. If a maintainer applies a patch, they are actually applying the patch themselves, they will use the signed off by tag as well. Otherwise, if they just agree to a patch, maybe it touches their subsystem, but they're not the ones applying it, they're gonna use the, um, the act by. Suggested by is if somebody suggested is like a fix, but didn't do it themselves, this is a great way, great way to um, give acknowledgement. And then co-developed, uh, two people worked on a patch, Whoever submits it puts their signed off and then you get a code developed. CC is a great way to add an email to somebody who should stay in the loop anytime anything happens to that patch. Say if your patch gets added in and somebody um, needs to maybe revert it or there's any kind of update communication, you wanna make sure that they're in the loop. The CC is a great way to add. And then there's fixes. Um, that will always reference a prior patch if it's fixing it. Um, this is really wonderful because if you, are ha if you find a problematic patch, this is a great thing to look for in the Git log um, to see if there is a lot of times already fixes out there. Um, and then closes and link is going to reference um, either bugs or communication. Um, a lot of times things that are on the mailing list that might need to be referenced. Uh, so initial part to getting involved is reporting bugs. I realize probably nobody came here to be asked to report bugs, but it is an important part of it. So if you encounter an issue, um, really the first thing to do is check first, make sure you're testing with a latest kernel. Um, there's a lot of times you're running into issue that may have already been fixed. Um, and then also checking mailing lists is check for your error before you submit something. Most of the time, and something's going to already be reported by the time that you probably encounter it. So check on the mailing list, 
Chess with the up latest kernel, see if you can find the solution already that's already been reported. Um, if you cannot, then debugging the issue, if you're able to, learning to do that, writing a git bisect if you already know a last known point, and sending the information that you're able to send with your bug report, anything that's gonna be able to help, um, help anyone who ends up digging into it to be able to resolve the issue. Um, if you maybe check your, you check the mailing list and somebody already submitted a fix but it hasn't been accepted by the maintainer yet, this is a great opportunity for you to take that patch, add it to your kernel, verify it resolves your issue, and then you can respond back to that patch that you tested it and verify that it's a fix. All right, and then also please, if you do start to communicate on the mailing list, to please stay engaged. Um, there's a lot of times there might be something missing from a bug report that somebody might need. They might not be able to reproduce what you are running into. So staying engaged is a very important step. I a lot of us do understand that um, you, know, you might not have all the time in the world to, of course, help out. So uh, this is kind of one of those any little information. A lot of times can be very helpful in us in getting things fixed. All right, so the next step of opportunity of getting involved is doing the release candidate testing. Um, again, this is testing kernels before they're released. There's two opportunities for this, so covered this a bit before. Uh, so the first one is that mainline release. This is going to be announced on the Linux kernel mailing list. These are the kernels before they have become stable. You'll look more than likely run into more issues on these ones, so it's a great opportunity for if you really want to find problems and help fix them and debug them, this is a great spot to dig into. If you want something that's a little bit more, a little safer, just so you can get used to doing the testing, uh, maybe getting used to sending emails on the mailing list, then helping test stable release candidates is a, is a really great spot to start. Um, again, these are usually about once a week. They're announced on the stable mailing list. It will come with a 48-hour window for tests. Um, and actually, the screenshot is one of the recent um, emails um, for the review. So it's going to always have, it always has this format. Um, it will have a list underneath it of all the patches that are included. And as for tests, gives you the time that the test, are, that the test window closes. And all you do is you, you test this, and then you're going to respond to this email saying, like, this looks good to me. You add your, you can add your tested by tag to it. Um, this is one of those, anything is valuable here. We want, it, the goal of this is to get this tested on as much hardware in different environments as possible. Um, there are people who go further and run a lot of test suites to help find issues. That is great. Um, there is also multiple stable kernels. So don't feel like you do need to do it all. This is one of those, do, it's kind of one of those like do what you have time for and where you can help. Um, this is also a very good spot that if you are maintaining a kernel at a company or maybe you are running your own and you're updating your own kernel, taking it from upstream, this is a really great time to test to make sure that you're not running into issues. Um, because if you do, you run a git bisect, you can find out the problem and you can say this, this commit, Causes, a, causes my build to break. Um, it is a lot easier to have stop it from going out to stable at this point than once it's released, it's gonna need to go through a report system and getting fixed. So, and then also you don't have a surprise when you go to update. So I highly recommend that if you are um, consistently pulling from upstream um, that you get in the habit of testing here just to, at least to make sure that um, you have a little bit more forewarning on if there's any issues. And then, of course, helping out the community by reporting. Hello? Yay, all right. Review and test patches on the mailing list. <laughs> so, mentioned before, there's a bunch of different mailing lists. Um, I recommend, if you're getting started, pick a subsystem you're interested in. Uh, maybe you want to learn about how networks work or PCI, um, there is a lot of opportunity and options. Um, I don't recommend to try doing them all. It's a lot. Just pick one you want to learn. You can change it at any point. Um, it's a great way to start to understand how that area of the kernel works. So any review of testing is 
this is, any of this is helpful. Um, a lot of what the reviews are is checking for proper patch format and coding style, so that's probably a very fun thing, but a very great thing of the Linux kernel is there is a patch format and coding style is very particular. Now this is wonderful, especially in a large project, um, but it, there is a bit of a learning curve on it. So um, especially on your first patch, when you go to create your first patch, there's a bit of time spent on making sure that you are catching all those little details. Um, we'll cover that a little bit more here. So, but it is great if you can start catching those on other people's patches to help make sure that their patches are getting into getting accepted. Um, this is also gonna help out the reviewers that are typically on, like the primary reviewers on that subsystem and the maintainers. If you're able to help get through patches and catch those, and catch any little errors, um, you can run tests on them. Um, it's great, again, if a patch is a fix, um, even if you're not running into the issue, try to see if you can reproduce it and then verify the fix is a great way to be able to test. So getting on the mailing list and just trying to go through the patches that are getting submitted there too and seeing where you can review. You don't have to review them all. There's not an order you can pick and choose the ones that you feel comfortable being able to tackle. And it is okay to respond on the mailing list um, and ask questions. Maybe something isn't clear. Um, maybe you're questioning the way a certain piece of code is written. It's okay to respond and ask questions. It doesn't have to be a very direct, this should be changed or a sign off. Oh, on the bottom of this, there is a link to a patch style checker. So this is a wonderful script that you, that you can run. Um, it lives in the kernel and it will check coding styles. Now, this is a great way, you always wanna run this before, like if you're building your own, you can run it on the kernel currently, but I will do a warning. There are some false positives. Occasionally, there's going to be something that, um, that this script is going to say, like, this is not good, but there's gonna be a logical reason for why that is that way. So if you go in and you run this, you're trying to fix something that's already in the kernel, and you do this, um, try to like go into the mailing list or review that commit that added that in and see, check to see if there's a logical reason why it's that way um, before trying to send a patch for that. Um, but it is always a potential way to find um, errors that are already out there. And it's good to set, do this on patches that are already on the mailing list you're reviewing and especially on your own. Um, and then the final step is submit your own patches. So this of course is gonna be the, the biggest achievement and a lot of times, a lot of times the, the goal, which is, um, of course, always exciting. Um, for this, when you build your own patches, make sure you're building on the latest kernel version available. This, a lot of times you want to try to build on top of, if you're doing Linux Next or anything that has the, think of like the latest and greatest. Um, each subsystem has their own trees. So like let's say if I'm going to submit something to Hyper-V, then I'm gonna likely go to the maintainer Hyper-V branch, grab that, and then I wanna make sure that that patch is going to build and work on top of that. Because you need to, not only do you need to take into consideration the patches that are already released out and stable, and you wanna think of anybody else who's currently working on that subsystem that already submitted patches that got accepted by the maintainer that are getting staged. Um, which also is a good idea to make sure that somebody isn't already working on what you're working on. Um, make sure to test your changes thoroughly. It's gonna, you know, sometimes you'll miss things, but do the best you can to test anything that your code touches. Um, that's gonna usually involve a lot of like different config options, running test suites, um, maybe different environments. So there is guides. It very much so will depend on where you are changing. It depends on maybe what, what, how extensive or what set of tests you're gonna wanna do. And then separate all logical changes into their own commits. This is very important. If you send a commit that is a thousand lines long, um, not a lot of people are gonna wanna review that, if any. Um, same with if you send a pull request that just has hundreds of commits in it. Um, this, is, this is really risky. This is a maintainer's gonna look at that and be like, have, they're not gonna have time to be able to actually thoroughly review that. And these changes need to have a proper review before getting added in. Um, we wanna make sure that we're not adding in security risk or things that we're not catching. So if you send something that is 
difficult to review. It is an easy way to get a maybe a quick denial or um, no response. So if you do need to send something that is a very large change, um, it could be worth to maybe send, you can send what's called a request for comment, an RFC to the mailing list, maybe get a communication going with as much information as you can, especially before doing all the work to see, is this a reasonable change that you're gonna be able to make and try to ask that maintainer and work with that maintainer. Um, and then there are some other things like make sure that the right people are getting your patch. Um, you wanna make sure you're sending your commits to like the right maintainer. Don't send PCI changes to a, the Hyper-V team. Um, so sending it to the right place so you get the right reviews. And if people respond to your stuff on the mailing list, please respond back. Um, it is whether it's questions or somebody takes the time to review your patch, uh, some kind of thank you is always definitely nice. And then of course, celebrate when you, when you make a change. It is good, even I think I hear a lot of people when they start discount themselves for if they do something small, getting any kind of change into the kernel, it takes a good, there's a lot to learn and it is. So if you hear anyone say it, oh, I just changed this, correct them. This is a really great thing and uh, it takes a lot of work to do it and it's a, it's a really cool accomplishment. So super fun part for me is this was one of my first patches. Um, so I picked this on purpose because I wanted to demonstrate a few things on it. Um, first, this is gonna help, I wanted to point out a couple of the patch styles on this that are really good things to look for and make sure that you do. So if we look, if we start up at the top, um, it's sent to the PCI maintainer, this is a, a change in the PCI subsystem. So sending it to the PCI maintainer, uh, the PCI mailing list, and then Linux kernel. I'm CCing people that I don't necessarily need um, a sign off by, but they might be interested in it. So these are people who might want to have a say in it and need to know about it. You're gonna wanna make sure that you are keeping people who should know about your changes in the loop. Um, then the subject line is important. You'll notice on here, this is, it says patch. Anything you're saying to the mailing list that is a patch needs to have the uh, little patch sign on it. Um, there's a lot of volume on the mailing list. This helps to identify what is what are patches. Um, then you see V3. This is version three that I sent. I think I might have actually sent a version four of this. So that is new revision, something that somebody came back and said, hey, this should be changed. This needs to be edited. Um, so this was the third time that I sent this patch to the mailing list. And then one out of four means this is out of a patch series. There was four patches in the series. And this, yeah, this was just one out of the four. Um, there will always be a zero. Um, that's a cover letter. If you're sending a patch series, you always want a cover letter. And then subject is also, you'll see titled with where the change is getting directed to and then a, on the shorter side, uh, subject title. Uh, you always wanna include a descriptive commit log. This is very important. Please never just do, this changes things or this is a fix. Um, please be descriptive. Um, make sure that if somebody goes back and is debugging or trying to look at the code, it's gonna help them to figure out what's going on and why that change was made. Uh, you'll see the assigned off by. Again, this is required. Um, it will not get accepted without this. Um, if you do manage to forget this, I'm sure somebody on the mailing list will catch it and remind you. And then the thing that isn't on this um, that can't, that you'll often see is those three little dashes. You can add comments below that. So a lot of times that's used as an area to show revisions, like, oh, from version two to version three, I needed to make this change. Um, I likely did that in um, the cover letter or a different patch, I'm betting. But usually you wanna add that just so people don't need to go back through the mailing list and find your old revision to see, well, why did this need to be updated and figure out the history. Um, and as my fun little, I'm trying to bring Clippy back, it's gonna be great, um, as pointing out, is this went through a lot of review. I had a couple different sign-offs on this, it went through the whole test process, got released, and then it broke a user space application. Thankfully, I didn't need to revert the whole thing. Um, I was alerted by Bjorn, who's the PCI maintainer. I just needed to go and fix a couple lines, um, but everything was okay. I didn't get yelled at. Um, it was, it happens. 
Um, it's really hard to test everything. Um, you're not going to run all the different types of hardware and all the user space and all the, all the situations. We do the, you do the best that you can, catch what you can, and sometimes you're still going to break things and it's going to be okay. Um, ideally, hopefully you will be available to come back and fix if, make a fix and revision because you'll know your code best um, if it does break something. And last part for me is Finding task bugs to work on. So there's a few ways. Um, the first one I already covered is that check patch. Again, please keep in mind of the potential false positives. There might be a logical reason of why that something is done the way that it is. Search for to-dos in the kernel source tree. Um, I did this while I was putting together this um, presentation, and I'm still not fully convinced that it wasn't user error, but I grew up for to-do, and I think there was like over 5,000 that came back. I'm still hesitant, so there, regardless, is a lot of opportunity. Um, a good portion that I did see get printed out were in documents. This is a great spot for beginners to dive into. Documentation can be a lot less intimidating than getting into C code, especially if you're still learning C. So document, getting in and doing documentation is a great way to start understanding how the kernel works and still contributing and helping out. Explore mailing lists, especially there's a mailing list called regressions. Um, you'll see, you'll be able to find reports. Um, maybe somebody needs help and doesn't have time. That happens sometimes where somebody's trying to submit something and then they run out of time to be able to continue working on it. So you might, if there's like a subsystem you're really paying attention to, you might be able to catch those and help somebody out. Uh, run test suites to find failing or my favorite flaky tests that sometimes pass, sometimes fail. Uh, Bugzilla hosts a lot of bugs that get reported um, upstream. And then of course, implement any changes you want to see. Maybe you want to see a new driver get supported or want some kind of different status from the kernel. Um, so yeah, these are definitely several ways to be able to get involved that are directly in the kernel or find opportunities. And at this point, I'm gonna pass it off to Alan to just go through some of the common pitfalls. Oh, I gotta turn this off first. Hello, so let's hope Kelsey's convinced you guys enough to come back and contribute to the kernel, and, uh, and you decide to contribute to the kernel. So what's the one thing that scares you the most? Breaking something. Breaking something? That's actually true, but for me, what scared me the most was getting yelled at by Linus. <laughs> so what are we gonna talk with uh, about two slides here? So the <clears throat> All of these pitfalls, all of these mistakes are something that I've personally made. Uh, I've also not learned from them, so I'm still making those mistakes. So let's go about the first one. Uh, it's inadequate testing. So kernels, what, a bit of 30,000 C files, 20,000 header files. It's pretty difficult to test everything. The change that you make might uh, not, uh, let's say you make a change on x86 and then that might not be needed on the ARM side, but, but you still have to test that code, right? So a lot of times people, when they write their code, they only test their little code and not end up testing the entire kernel, so it's something that actually gets missed out. And uh, I did that for several uh, subsystems and I got yelled at a couple of times by Greg for saying, oh, you're not done enough testing. So make sure that you test the kernel really well. Uh, modifying without context. So this is, again, uh, I was working on a project, not project, a task where we were doing some timer update stuff. And then I didn't think I really understood the code really well. And then I went and did some changes to kernel.h. And the first person to write back to that email was Linus. He said some nice, beautiful things to me. <laughs> uh, but, but the story here is uh, 
these are the people who have done kernel development for about 30 years, right? So they really care about what, uh, the, what code they write. They really care about what you do and all of that. So please understand the code, read through, experiment, and then only if you're convinced that this is the right thing to do, send it upstream, right? So uh, this I think Kelsey spoke about. The third one's uh, pretty important. Make sure that you follow the coding guidelines. Uh, I think Linus did speak about spaces and tabs yesterday. So all of these little things really matter. And all this, this massive document that Greg's written, which talks about all of these coding styles and best practices, how to submit patches, how to get involved with the community and all of that. So that's uh, probably is a good thing to do before we get involved with kernel development. And uh, community feedback. So this is a bit of a problem because you think you're the best programmer, but there are better programmers out there. So they have their own ways of doing things. So they come back and tell, okay, this is a crappy code. Why don't you change it? And if you are hell-bent on saying, no, this is the way I'm going to keep it, I'm not going to change, you will not be very welcome in the community. right? So be open to it, be flexible, uh, take feedbacks constructively, have fun doing kernel development. And uh, yeah, when you get your patch in, it's the coolest thing to party on, right? So yeah, so these are the four points that I had. Uh, basically covers a little bit of my experience doing kernel development for about 15 years now. And yeah, when you get your patch in, you can be proud in saying that I contributed to a project that actually runs on Mars, right? So with that, uh, I think we are open for questions. Yes. Uh, either one of us can take the question. Go on. Yeah. I've been using GitHub for years, so that was a mailing list stuff. It's a bit overwhelming. So, do you, you, what kind of mail client are you using? And are you using that for other random email needs, or is it just for kernel development? Uh, so I use Mott, my client. I'm subscribed to pretty much, uh, I think, a lot of mailing lists. And quite honestly, I don't read all the mails. Uh, so I have filters which basically uh, I focus on certain subsystems that I work on. So I try and catch up on all of them. But it's, it's like you said, it's overwhelming. It's just impossible to read every email that comes through all of these mailing lists. Uh, we are very active on the stable mailing list where we uh, do the testing. Uh, we really care about what patches are getting picked for the stable kernels because that affects all the products that we work on. So that is something that we keep close eye on, but LKML is only for subsystems that I work on. And uh, I don't know what client you use. There are other options, and I believe I listed it on one of the one of the slides that in the documentation that's in the phone. There is actually one for email clients. I see. And are you using Matt for other, like from your company's email, everything? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, if you're already a Matt user, I know Matt has a little bit of a learning curve. So, warning to that if anybody's checking it out. It's wonderful when you get it set up. I but. see. <laughs> thank you. Your copyright uh, holder is written in the license file. Oh, for the licensing? Yes. Yes. So, yeah, you want to make sure that everything is going to be covered under that licensing and that you're not doing anything against that, of course, right? So that's actually part of the for the sign for the sign off is that you are agreeing that uh, what you're writing government. is authorized. You're agreeing to that that it's going to be. No, oh, sorry, everyone. actually yeah. okay 
So the signed off by tag is, is that is your signed off by and agreeing that it's going to be covered under the license. It's like the, uh, I forget the name of it, it's a certificate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. How does that help answer that? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, anybody else? No, that's it. All right. If you see me, you can always come and ask me directly. I'm always happy to try to help out. Um, you can always reach out later if you run into an issue. You can find me online. I'm happy to send documentation or help to anybody who's working on getting started. So, all right. Thank you, everybody, for attending.